the message I'm going to share with you today will be slightly different to all those I uh, usually share for this place. Because we are going to talk today about something very and extremely sad. When we talk about Christian life and Christian walk with God, our walk, daily walk with God, there are so many people, so many uh, Christians, and I'm not saying only Seventh-day uh, Adventist Christians, I'm talking about the Christians from all denominations who believe, rightly so, that if you're not happy all the time, if you're not positive, cheerful, uppity, whatever, that you're not Christian at all. That you cannot be Christian if you don't follow what is written here. And usually what they quote are these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And I believe most of you know quite well what is written there. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. Can we rejoice always? We cannot. There are times in our lives when it's quite difficult to rejoice. When you feel so down, so sad, it's difficult to see any light. And when we, as Christians, are seen by somebody else to be down, to be sad, and you know, and everything else. There are always some very good and smart um, brothers and sisters from the church, from our church, our churches, who would tell us, if you're a true believer, you wouldn't be like this. You would be happy, and you should be happy. I remember... I probably told you this, maybe I didn't, but it doesn't matter right now. When my late brother was diagnosed with, with bone marrow cancer in 2009, so we were in Canada. The only brother I had, one year younger than me. It hit me very hard. Diagnosis? was terrible, dreadful, because you know it's a death sentence. It's only a matter of time. I didn't know how to cope with that. Just didn't. I've seen, you know, I had seen people being sad. I had seen losses. I had seen people losing their loved ones. I had performed so many funeral services. I stopped counting a long time ago. And you believe that it's, you know, that you can understand, that you can relate to their pain and suffering to all that. But when the doctor told me his diagnosis, When I, when I had seen my parents being totally smitten, overwhelmed with that, with, with sadness, grief, and everything, 
knowing that one day I would lose my brother. As I said, I just didn't know what to do. I, I, I understood then that I didn't know anything. Not until it hits you personally, your family, you don't have a clue. But anyway, at that time, why am I telling you this? At that time, there was one brother from the church who saw me being overwhelmed by grief and sadness and, and, and depression and everything else. And he told me, why are you so sad? You'll see your brother one day. I just didn't know what to do. I just didn't know what to say. Why all this right now? Because today I'm going to, I would like to share with you the most depressing psalm of the Bible. So now the question is, which psalm is the most depressing of them all? What do you think? My close family members, keep your mouth shut because you probably know the answer. And the funny thing is, I, uh, I got the idea for this sermon by my father. My father gave me the idea for this sermon. So what do you think? Which of 150 psalms can be called the most depressing psalm of the entire Bible? 102. No. No. Nice try, but no. Not even Psalm 22. With Jesus Christ quote on the cross. Not even that one. Because it's far too positive compared to what I'm going to share with you. It's Psalm number 88. And let us read that Psalm. And we'll see there is something very interesting and funny about it. I'm going to read first this introductory, uh, these introductory notes. A song, a psalm of the sons, sons of Korah to the chief musician said to Mahalat Lenot, a contemplation of Heman the Ezrahite. O Lord, God of my salvation. So listen to these words very carefully. I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles. And my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead. Like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. You have laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. And you have afflicted me with all your waves, Selah. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and I cannot get out. My eyes waste away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark? and your righteousness in the lead of forgetfulness. 
But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me all together. Loved one and friend you have put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. And this is the end of Psalm 88. What do you think of it? It is depressing, isn't it? Quite depressing. And yet, this psalm is right here in the Bible. There is almost nothing positive in this psalm. There is absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel. This person, and he's identified as Haman, the Ezraite. This person, Haman, was basically wailing before God. This is even worse than Jeremiah's lamentations. And this psalm comes in stark contrast with those words we read at the beginning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Give thanks to God at all times. That, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, is the word of God. This Psalm 88 is also the word of God. God said through his faithful servant, Paul, rejoice always. Here, another faithful servant, a writer of this Psalm 88, is wasted, done. There is no hope. There is nothing positive in his life. And these words come from Haman. And it's very interesting. When we read and when we try to identify this person, we will find something quite interesting. Because this Haman, let us read... First book of Kings, chapter 4, verse 31. Well, we can read also verse 30 and 31. For those of you who have creation Bibles, Christians Kasadashnost, it would be chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. But in other Bibles, it's chapter 4, verses 30 and 31. And this is what it says. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. Then Ethan the Ezrahite and Haman, Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. We all know that King Solomon was very wise, the wisest man on earth. And mind you, the Bible says that he was so wise, even wiser than Haman. So a few names were mentioned, and one of them was Haman. 
if you read Bible commentaries, different ones, even the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary, you will see that they all identify Haman from 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 31, as the author of Psalm 88. So somebody who was very wise, somebody whose wisdom was basically exceeded only by that, by that one, by King Solomon, was the one who wrote that most depressing psalm of the Bible. Very wise. The Bible also says in 1 Chronicles chapter 25, and let us also find those words, 1 Chronicles chapter 25, Musicians, the Musicians, that's the title or subtitle of that chapter. Here are the names of the musicians in the temple who stood before the Lord and sang. I'm going to read verses 4 through 6, chapter 25, first book of Chronicles. Of Heman, the sons of Heman, Bukiah, Mataniah, Uziel, Shebuel, Jeremoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliatha, Gedalti, Ramamtiezer, Jokbekasha, Malathi, Hothir, and Mahaziah. All these were the sons of Haman, the king's seer, in the words of God, to exalt his horn. For God gave Haman 14 sons and three daughters. So this man, and again, the Bible commentaries identify Haman, the, the author of the 88th Psalm, as the one who was very wise and as the one who was among the musicians who stood before the Lord and sang. We also know here that he was what? He was the seer, which means what? He was the prophet. So now, so listen to this. We have somebody who is a prophet, somebody who is extremely wise, who is not single, 14 sons and three daughters, and who could have written something quite cheerful. Instead, he writes something so depressing that you probably want to kill yourself after reading it. I'm kidding. Psalm 88 gives us something that identifies some of the problems that Heman, the author of Psalm 88, had. It says here, I'm counted, verse 4, with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength. What does this tell you? It means that he suffered and he was probably deadly, mortally sick. He had some type of illness, disease, for everybody, for which everybody knew that his days were numbered. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. And then, you have laid me, verse 6, in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your ways. This is terrible. For somebody who is a prophet of God, who was so wise, 
to say something like this, what does this tell you? And then we can find some quite familiar verses. Verses 10 through 12. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? King Hezekiah, when healed of his illness, when he was given additional 15 years of life, he's practically quoting these words from Psalm 88. He was so happy, and he's quoting this to show that people who go to their grave, that people who are, you know, gone, cannot praise God. But he was happy that he was made alive and healthy, that he was healed, so he was able now, he was in position to praise God wholeheartedly. And it says here again, Haman is not finished. But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? My question for you right now. Was he right in saying something like this? Did God truly hide his face from him? What do you think? No. The answer is simple, no. But yet, he felt so down that he thought he was completely alone. Exactly. I have been afflicted and listen to this, I have been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. So this is even, even more interesting. So despite his 17 children altogether, despite, of, you know, despite his position you know, at king's court, despite his position and service as a prophet of God, he had a, some kind of illness, disease, he was, it says here, afflicted from his youth. Quite sick for a very long time. We can just guess what kind of illness was that. But something incurable, slowly progressing. And he knew about his end. Um, to all of you, what I'm going to share with you, I, I shared with just a few of you, not, not with the church, never with the church, because it's quite personal. And what I'm going to share with you, it's, it's quite personal. It happened after my brother's death. Um, he died on Sunday, Monday night. I flew to Croatia. I arrived Tuesday, midday, Central European time. Thursday, we had a funeral service, 27th of July last year. Saturday, we didn't go to the church. We stayed home. We, we just couldn't go. And, and, and you know the feeling. You know how it goes. There are people, you're completely stricken with sadness and grief. And there are people coming to you, oh, please, you know, sorry for your loss. It's very difficult. I know. How can we help you? You know, I believe they, you know, they really think that. And then somebody comes, you know, 
pats them on their back. Oh, hi, how are you? So good to see you. Mwah, mwah. I just couldn't, you know, couldn't stand it like that. So we decided, you know, we're staying home. And we took my brother's laptop. Um, and went through his documents. And I was looking for a song, a poem that he had written at that time of his diagnosis. Uh, couldn't find it. And while going through all those folders, I found, by accident, um, a document, a war document, hidden you know, in one folder that was hidden in another folder and that was again in another folder. My dear Heavenly Father, something like that. That was the title. Dragi nebeski oče. What is this? I clicked on it. The date was May 11, 2015. Monday more than two years before his death. It was his prayer to God, his cry to God. He was literally begging God to save his life. My parents didn't have a clue about that letter. Nobody had a clue. It was like reading the words of a man who was already in grave, reading the words of the dead man. We all started to cry. And it was like reading Psalm 88. My dear brothers and sisters, there are times in our lives when we are squeezed from all sides. Do you sometimes feel like that? Everything, it seems like everything goes downhill. And not only downhill, everything is just a free fall. That happened to Prophet Elijah after his most prominent, most you know, famous victory for God. You remember Mount Carmel when he cried out uh, to God and uh, the fire came from heaven and then he, you know, and the people killed 450 prophets of Baal. So there was a huge victory for both Elijah and God. He fled. He was afraid. He didn't want to live anymore. He was there running away from Jezebel, Queen Jezebel. And when God asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? You remember those words and that event. What are you doing here? He said, God, nobody is left faithful. I'm the only one. You see, in his mind, and he said, I don't want to live anymore. If he went to the doctor at that very moment, he would have been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, given some antidepressants. It was that bad. He didn't want to live. God gave him some food and asked him kindly, what are you doing? And you remember what came next. Elijah said, I'm the only one. But God told him, you're not the only one. There are 7,000 people in the land of Israel who didn't bow down before Baal. And I'm going to send you to anoint Elisha as your successor, as the prophet. And this is the only time, that was the only time in the Bible, my dear brothers and sisters, where we see that a man, a prophet, anoints another prophet, or another man to, be, to become a prophet. 
That's the only time in the Bible. Every single time, it's the God who calls, personally calls that person. But that was the only time in the Bible when that call came through another man. And that call God gave through his faithful servant Elijah. There are times in our lives when we feel down, when there is no light. At least we believe there is no light. Elijah thought there was no light. And when we think there is no light, everything seems really, really, really dark. Hence Elijah's words, I'm the only one left who is serving you. He truly and honestly thought that he was the only one who was left. Why did I choose this particular song? Do I want to make all of you depressed? God forbid. Do I want to, and, or am I trying to glorify somebody's sadness? God forbid. But there are times, and God, trust me, understands those times when we don't see light, when we are sad. And you know what? It's normal to be sad. If you're not happy sometimes, don't try very hard to be happy because that will just make you even more miserable in the long run. In a short run, yeah, everything will be fine and people will be happy. And there is also another thing. Have you noticed that uh, all of us, myself included, we always tend to be closer or around people who tend to be positive. Have you noticed that? Nobody likes to be around people who are always negative. Am I right? You know, if you have somebody who is always, you know, face smiling and everything is just, so how are you today? Oh, never been better. You know, everything is so great and, and, and peachy and, and everything. You know, we normally somehow spontaneously tend to go and get around them. Nobody, none of us like to be around people. So how are you today? Oh, please don't ask me anything. Never been worse. Yeah, you know, once we will go, we will listen to them. But then the second time you ask them, so how's everything today? Please don't ask anything. Don't ask, don't want to talk to anybody. And you know what, you're like, oh, no, not again. <gasps> He's so difficult or she's so difficult. And you know what I'm talking about. But the fact is still that uh, sometimes in our lives, we act exactly like this author. And even in those times, and that's my message to all of us today, not to all of you, but to all of us, there is always hope. Even this author, Heman, knew all this time, through all those years, knew where his help was coming from. He said, Lord, I have called daily upon you. He didn't see any help, but it was God whom he called always. Job, in his affliction, after experiencing such a terrible loss on all fronts, said, even if he kills me, 
I will still trust in him. Even if he, something like that happens, I will still trust in him. Sometimes, and I shared with you what happened to me, you know, to, 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 to uh, Sabrina and, and, and me on Wednesday when we almost got killed. We almost died in a, you know, car accident. I felt really down that day. I hadn't slept the whole night. I was very tired, but I was still, you know, driving. So it, that part was okay. But then the police and everything. And that day, you know, going there, dealing with insurance, all those questions, and you just want to disappear and you have to respond to all those questions. And they tell you we're going to take care of uh, your substitute car rental and you go there, you have to do everything in just five minutes and you come there and uh, it's not five minutes, it's more than an hour because they miss something in a system. You have to call again and you have to go through the same process. You know, dial one for this, dial two for that. And then again, so dial one for this. And then please, please keep waiting. Some of our associates will be with you shortly. And that shortly never comes. And then, you know, as a top of everything, my glasses got broken. I mean, as I was like, seriously, God, why everything? Why today? It was awful. Do I have to spend money on this too? Sometimes those things happen. But God promised that he would always be with us. And I know, I'm quite sure and positive, even though this psalm is so negative, or appears negative, Heman was among those who stood before God a singer. He was one of the singers. He was one of those who prophesied to King Solomon, to the Israelites, he was a prophet of God. It's possible sometimes to be sad, to be stricken with grief, with sadness. But God is also calling us, to, at the end of the day, to always look to God. To always look upon him. It may seem now that everything is down and everything is lost. But God always knows the best. And he always has solution for every problem. And you know, you remember me always keep saying, we may not understand some things now. But I know one day God promised that he will explain to us everything. And I long for that day. When he will explain all those wonders he had done in our lives. How he protected us all the way and all the time. When we will be able to see his blessings and his work, his steps, his guidance, and his deliverance in actions, in deeds, in times when we thought, oh, this is nothing, oh, this is just normal. God promised that he would reveal everything. And as I said, I long for that day. And I'm looking forward to that day. And my invitation my call to each and every one of us today is to follow God no matter what. Whether we are sad or happy. Whether everything goes right or everything goes downhill. To always follow God. 
to be with him. It's worth it. It's worth it, my dear brothers and sisters, to be with him. Because he has eternal life. And he's offering to each and every one of us eternal life. May God bless you all.